Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. Andrew Lord Claven, High Lord of the Universe, has some words on it. Lord Claven, Destroyer of Ease and Mech. Destroyer. Destroyer of the Multiverse. Master of the Multiverse is the correct uh, way to put it. Master of the Multiverse. What's going on about Ayn Rand here? He uses some examples way off base, makes some judgment calls that you can't really argue with because they're just his judgment call. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, way to approach it. Recently, Ben had Yaron Brook on his Sunday special to discuss Ayn Rand and objectivism. I can tell already this question is going to get me in big trouble. As a Catholic, I fundamentally disagree with Rand on certain claims. <coughs> Yaron made the claim that Judeo-Christian values are not Western values. That's a weird claim. I'm not sure what he... I mean, that's a, that would be a hard case to make, but I think probably what he said was the United States is not a Christian nation. However, um, Western values today come from the Renaissance, and though the values of the Renaissance come from Aristotle. So we're really an Aristotelian society in the West, insofar as we're successful. The good areas of the West, the powerful areas of the West, are Aristotelian, not just broadly Western. Christianity is from Plato's philosophy. Plato, Plato's philosophy is the world of the forms where there's a perfect thing in heaven and lots of bad copies here on earth. A perfect chair up there, lots of bad chairs here. A perfect man there called God and lots of individual men. Come on, get out of here. Lots of individual men all over um, earth that are imperfect copies of God. So... Christianity is just bastardized Platonism. It's nothing more than Platonism. The West is based on reason, which is Aristotle's whole thing. His whole shtick was reason and logic. So we are an Aristotelian culture. In that sense, we're not Judeo-Christian. But Judeo-Christianity is certainly the most powerful force throughout Latin America, and sans the United States, it is also the case in Europe that they are more Judeo-Christian than Aristotelian. The United States is Aristotelian thanks to the Founding Fathers. So, that's what I say about that. I don't know what Euron said, and I don't know if this questioner is, is correctly quoting Euron. How would you respond? Additionally, I would love to hear your thoughts on Ayn Rand and objectivism in general. Thanks. Okay, well, let me make it, just before I answer this question and step in it, which I'm about to do, um, let me first say that I did not watch this interview. I did not see Aaron Brook on Ben's show, so I'm not responding to what he said. I'm responding to what you say he said, okay? That's important, uh, because I don't want to take the guy on if I'm not even talking to him. Um, I think Ayn Rand sucks, okay? <laughs> I think her writing sucks. I think her books are unreadable. I think Atlas Shrugged, I mean, look, there's one speech in Atlas Shrugged that is worth reading. It's made maybe 15 times. The book is thousands of pages long. Uh, you know, I skimmed it. Uh, the Fountainhead is more readable, more exciting, but none of her characters are real. I have to say that Atlas Shrugged, the writing, embarrassed me a little bit when I first read it. Now, I've gotten over that. And I just read it as pretty good. The Fountainhead is amazing. Blowing up the low-income housing was a statement of principle. It wasn't an orphanage, which you'll say here in a minute. But arguing over the artistic merit of art is difficult to do because it takes a, your sense of life. Your view of art comes from your sense of life. And what's his sense of life like? So he has no correct basis or no good basis or objective basis or no proper basis to begin with to evaluate art anyway. So his evaluation of, of Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead will have to stand as it is. They all have those Nazi names like Rourke and Galt and, other, <laughs> and all the bad guys. And Francisco D'Anconia and Ragnar Danischold, all those Nazi names. Booch. She's not trying to write reality. She's trying to write uh, her... Who's trying to write reality? Wasn't that Hemingway's job? Wasn't old Hemingway the naturalist? Who's trying to write reality? I mean, Ayn Rand's trying to give an objective account of her view of reality, of, of her, what she thinks is important. 
what she thinks you should think is important, of what is important in her view, not just her opinion of what's important, but what she thinks is objectively important. That's what it's about. Um, she wasn't trying to give a picture of real life. That's what Hemingway was doing. Philosophy into fiction, and largely, I hate that. There are a few successful books that do that. Nineteen eighty. She was trying to do philosophy into fiction. He says there's a few successful books. Nineteen eighty four is one of them that take philosophy and put it into fiction, but most don't. Um, and I think he'll find, if he looks a little closer, that all really good novels put philosophy into fiction. Henrik Ibsen comes to mind. If you want to read a really, really good fictional account of anything, then get a, a quasi-philosopher, a quasi-philosophical text, like Henrik Ibsen. Henrik Ibsen's excellent. Um, and who else can I think of off the top of my head? Not many. <laughs> Not many, sadly. But Henrik Ibsen, if you aren't aware, and Enemy of the People, Doll's House, I think, and a few others. Very good. There's one of them. Um, but even, even 1984 is a great work of art, so that it can, uh, even though it's about the left, even though 1984 is a condemnation of the left, it's a, it becomes a condemnation of tyranny because it's art, so it's above politics and higher than politics, and it actually goes beyond politics. It's a condemnation of a way of thinking, groupthink. 1984 is a condemnation of groupthink. It's interesting that Andrew Claven would think it's a condemnation of the left um, because today we see groupthink as those on the left. On the right is people who want to think for themselves or they have their own different view of things. But if you, if you want to have a different view of things, if you want to have your own opinion, you can't be on the left. On the left, you have to check with the group for the toe-the-line toe opinion. On the right, we have a lot of different opinions. Some people are you know, Christians, some people are not. Lots of different things on the right. The left, mono-opinion, groupthink, all the same, collectivism. Her books, like once once you get her philosophy, her books, I just find them so boring and so stiff and so hard to read. Some of her nonfiction is a little bit more interesting, but no more true. Everything she says that's true, everything she says that is true, she really understands money. She really understands money. She had that clip of a uh, dollar bill. She really gets money. We... Everything she says about money is in a book by Frederick Bastiat, who was Reagan's favorite. All right, got to get Bastiat. If you're not aware of Bastiat, go to YouTube, look up his stuff, and listen to his stuff. Bastiat, Bastiat. Frederick Bastiat. B-A-S-T-I-A-T. -A -A Bastiat. If you don't know of him, get, listen to, read Bastiat. Her books, like once, once you get her philosophy, her books, I just find them so boring and so stiff and so... I don't think you get her philosophy, Mr. Clavin, if you think that it's just rehashed Americanism. Hard to read. Some of her nonfiction is a little bit more interesting, but no more true. Everything... I, I, some of her nonfiction is not... is no more true. Now, he's about to say that she gets money. She understands money. But I would like to know which what exactly he says is untrue. I would really like to know. He doesn't. He's not specific, so I can't defend her entire body of work. But I would like to know what he thinks is untrue. He says that's true. Everything she says that is true, she really understands money. She really... Un everything she says that is true, everything she says that is true, she really understands money. So that was a weird thing. She does say true things, so she says some true things, but whatever, she really understands money. That's not a very clear line of thought, but fair enough. That's money. She had that clip of a dollar bill. She really gets money. Everything she says about money is in a book by Frederick Bastiat, who was Reagan's favorite economist. Uh, he wrote a book, I think it's called The Laws, and it's 70 pages long. It's very readable. It's very simple, and everything Ayn Rand knows, I don't know if she just took it right out of that or if she, it came to her through some other path, but everything she knows, uh, she gets from Frederick Bastiat, and, and all you need is those 70 pages instead of her 1,000-page unreadable uh, diatribes. Unreadable. I've read them multiple times, but uh, Frederick Bastiat was writing things which 
to to him and to people at the time, these things seemed like almost self-evident. There was certainly lots of evidence in the world around for them. They, they made claim, Frederick Bastiat makes claims, that you have to have Ayn Rand in your pocket to really understand. If you just come out of our modern culture with no understanding of, of clear thinking, you can't get Frederick Bastiat. He says claims that you would dismiss. But coming from Ayn Rand, coming from objectivism, if you're thinking in that direction already, Frederick Bastiat is amazing. But that's because back in the day of the Founding Fathers, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, these things just made sense to people. Everybody just understood in the way that today we're getting back to this understanding that taxes damage the economy. Higher taxes, bad. Whatever you spend them on, the government taking money from the economy slows the economy down. We're getting back to an understanding of that, which is something they understood 200 years ago. And we went through a period where we forgot it. All of society was taught that it wasn't true, and everybody forgot it, we had to rediscover it. So culturally, we're going through this period of rediscovery, where we're coming back to understand these things that were understood by people like Frederick Bastiat. So get Frederick Bastiat and read him. But... Um, he says he doesn't know where Ayn Rand got her stuff about money. Maybe he got it from, maybe she got it from Frederick Bastia. But anybody can say a reasonable thing about money. A, a, an objective statement about money or about, it's like saying, it's like saying this guy discovered electricity. I don't know where he got his stuff. He must have got it from Benjamin Franklin. Well, you know, maybe but maybe he discovered it on his own. I mean, the facts of electricity are simply out there in the universe. You don't have to go back to the original discoverer to discover them yourself. Sometimes we do discover facts, or we have realizations or epiphanies, and then we go look for it, and we find, oh, other people have already said this. This is in an essay or a book. This is an idea, a poem. There's, here's this, that I thought I was discovering and thinking of the first time. Because that's reality. You go out and discover something in reality for the first time for you. But today we're discovering these truths about money and the economy and so on that have been in books the whole time, but culturally we've forgotten them. Culturally, they're not taught in our schools or our colleges or our universities or by our intellectuals. They're not in our newspapers. They're not in our, on our TV. So they're just gone from popular culture. So we have to rediscover these things that were obvious truths to previous generations. That, that is what I think. Secondly, obviously, while she does know about, um, about money and the economy and capitalism, uh, her moral and artistic judgments are insane. They are insane. And her moral judgment that you should think for yourself and act for yourself. That's insane. Now, he's going to mention blowing up a orphanage. It wasn't an orphanage. It was low-income housing. It was a government housing project. She was like she fell in love with some like serial killer at one point from a distance uh, because, I, and I don't, I, that's not surprising to me. I, I wouldn't just pick on her for it personally, but she, her moral stances are insane. The idea that you put your happiness above all and that capitalism solves all problems is... <coughs> First of all, put your happiness above all what else do you propose? Some form of socialism or communism or duty or what? Yeah, he does. He's religious, right? So your happiness is above all just by the nature of life. I mean, Aristotle made that case. We all, anybody with half a brain knows that happiness is the end of all action. So you lose there, Andrew. You can't do anything about that. Happiness is the end of action. But as for the other claim, which I've now forgotten, pick on her for it personally, but her moral stances are insane. The idea that you put your happiness above all and that capitalism solves all problems. Now, here's what capitalism is. I'm surprised that this guy doesn't have a better grasp of capitalism. Capitalism is when people are free to do as they see fit. People are free to do as they please without hurting other people. They can do what they please. So, in capitalism, you don't just get the most efficient and the best. You get lots and lots of answers. 
to a given problem, whatever the problem is. So the idea that capitalism solves all problems, hurt, hurt. What other system could solve the problem? If any system can solve the problem, capitalism can. If it can be solved, capitalism is the system that will solve it. Now, that doesn't mean capitalism will solve every problem. It just means that if it can be solved, you, 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 you're best off having capitalism. The problem of gravity was not solved under capitalism, but it was solved in a relatively, you know, sort of a free country where the guy was able to think for himself and write things without being burned at the stake. So freedom of action without interference really is the base of progress. But the fun thing, the interesting thing about capitalism, the really fun thing about it, is that it has such a broad array of things going on. Half of the restaurants in this nation today are not making a profit. A bunch of them are going to struggle on for another two, three, five years before they shut down. Some of them are going to shut down today, next week, next month, and next year. The other half are making a profit, some of which are going to shut down even though they're making a profit. And some of them are just going to continue, some of them are going to grow, some of them are going to continue just with the same number of stores. You know, there's all different varieties of businesses going on in the United States. There are car manufacturing businesses that are losing money. But they do not make money. What? That's weird. That's like communism or socialism, right? Well, would you be surprised to know that there are communes in capitalism? Would you be surprised to know there are places where groups of people go to try to act like little communist societies? So we've got everything in capitalism. Everything. So the idea that capitalism could solve all problems, a hurt, hurt. Capitalism has every solution open to any other society, plus myriads of other solutions not open to those societies because they stop people from thinking and acting. That's why capitalism is amazing. Not because it's got magic sauce or something like that, but because it lets people do what they think they should do for their own lives. And that leads to progress more than somebody else bossing people around. You go do what I tell you to do because I think it's best for everybody. That's disaster. Everybody just going about their own way, doing their own thing, is capitalism. And that solves more problems than anybody can propose. Ridiculous. She claims, she claims that the only proper um, system for an objectivist is capitalism, as if capitalism were an outgrowth of objectivism. But I The only proper system for an individual is a system that allows the individual to act in accordance with his understanding of reality. <clears throat> How do you like that for a claim, Mr. Clavin? The only system that's appropriate for human beings is the system which allows them to act within their nature as human beings. How's that for a claim? Now, is that an insane claim? Because that's Ayn Rand's claim. Your, your nature as an individual human being is reason. That's your method of... of understanding the world of surviving, reason. And capitalism is that system which allows you to use your mind to sustain your life. You're not bossed around by other people. What other system would you propose, Andrew Clavin? He just has in mind, he just has in mind all of the nonsense, antitrust fallacies and stuff. Not a sophisticated thinker and that capitalism solves all problems is ridiculous. She claims, she claims that the only proper um, system for an objectivist is capitalism, as if capitalism were an outgrowth of objectivism. But I believe that objectivism is actually an outgrowth of capitalism. Well, interesting, interesting way to look at it there. Objectivism is an outgrowth of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is an outgrowth of capitalism. So, Ayn Rand was giving the moral defense for a system which, which came into existence because of a moral stance. The Founding Fathers took a moral stance. They said, uh, you, it's immoral to interfere with other people. You shan't interfere with other people. And they wrote all these different ways. 
freedom of religion, freedom of spree speech, gun ownership, uh, search and seizure, um, uh, uh, forcing someone to 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 give testimony against themselves, Fifth Amendment, all these things. They said you shan't interfere with other people, and that's freedom. That's the freedom we have here. It is simply freedom from other people's interference. That's all capitalism is. So that system led to tremendous wealth. And everybody looked around and said, whoa, what's all this wealth coming from? Who's getting robbed? So then Ayn Rand had to sit down and write her philosophy and say, nobody got robbed. Poverty was inherited. It's good that we are able to produce things. It leads to betterment of human life and happiness. So first came Aristotle's philosophy. Then came the Founding Fathers, then came a massive increase of wealth, then came the attack on wealth, and then came Ayn Rand to defend this wealth-creating machine we call capitalism. That's how it went. He thinks that this system is the bee's knees, this is her religion, and it's going to solve every problem, and of course it doesn't. Uh, the moral decisions that people... It, it doesn't solve every problem. It solves every solvable problem. Hey in uh, the fountainhead are absurd. Blowing up an orphanage because you can't get it the way you like it is an absurd moral choice. Let's say the problem you want to solve is bad housing, right? Capitalism's not going to solve that because it's going to have lots of people living homeless on the street and tents who don't care. They don't want to pay for a house. They don't want a job. And there's too much wealth available. They can just go down to this local, you know, park or whatever where free food gets handed out on weekends to homeless people. Or they go to some soup kitchen and get some church runs the soup kitchen for anybody who's humble enough to come stand in line with homeless people and eat. You're welcome to eat. No questions asked. And once in a while you see a business guy, guy in there with a business suit. He's on his way to some job and he has no money and he's in there eating at a soup kitchen. Right? Those things happen. In capitalism, we have the freedom to do all kinds of things, including live homeless on the street and go to some charity soup kitchen for your food. So capitalism's not going to solve... I've said this before, I'll say it again. In capitalism, you're going to get many, many, many things that lots of people aren't going to like. You're going to have drug use and, and drinking and pornography and strip clubs and and, uh, you know, the Socialist Club of America, and the, um, the Communist Commune of Indiana, and uh, the Mormon Church in Utah, and you're going to have all kinds of weird things in freedom. The point about freedom is that we've got all these men with guns around, and if anybody hurts anybody else or attacks anybody else, we send the men with guns over. That's the thing, and everybody, a lot of them have guns themselves, too. That's the thing about freedom is that we stop people from interfering with each other. And under those conditions, people create a tremendous amount of wealth for themselves and for other people. They create wealth and offer it to other people. And the other people buy the wealth that's been created. And then they are able to make their lives better. You know, like the old plows that John Deere made. They went from one old crappy type of plow to the new John Deere steel plow. And it made farmers across the nation wealthier. By this guy making a piece of wealth, selling it to you, and now you can be more productive, and now you're making more wealth. And that multiplies, multiplies in capitalism. Putting your happiness first, putting profits above everything. She says you should seek your own self-interest, putting profits above everything. I mean, look at it. Look, look, all you have to do is you look, you know, they're, they're suing. Uh, they just got a judgment against Johnson & Johnson. for. Oh, boy. So the government tells us that we can't take drugs because it's bad for us. And then the government licenses a company to make the drugs that it's erstwhile made illegal and then that company sells the drugs that the government previously has made illegal for us to buy and sell amongst ourselves and then 20 years later the government investigates the company for selling the drug now the whole thing is a mess the whole thing is a mess this is what happens when you give the government the power to protect you from drug use Oh, we should, we should stop everybody from using heroin. It's so bad. Oh, all right. Now heroin's illegal. You go to your doctor's office. Doctor says, we've got this pain pill. It's not addictive. 
shows you a video from GlaxoSmithKline that this stuff is not addictive, and you get on it, and now you're addicted to heroin, legally, from a, a government-sanctioned, licensed entity. So you want to get heroin out of society, huh? I say screw you. Go live in a communist society if you think you can do that kind of stuff. Heroin should be legal. Yeah, there's going to be some guy laying on a corner, high as shit. True. But the other option is to have government-licensed factories selling it to us. And then putting the doctors in jail who sold it to us and coming to our houses and putting all of us in jail who, who bought it or are using it or whatever. You know, it just... What? They're not going to stop us from using it. But that's what the first thing was. Make it illegal to stop people from using it. They're not going to stop you from using it. They're going to sell it to you. The government. The government factory. You know, it's not a government factory, but the, a factory that pays taxes to the government. That's, that's regulated by the government. That's known by the government. They're the ones that are going to sell it to you if we make it illegal. Isn't that amazing? So that's what I think of the illegality of heroin. And the fact that he thinks that that's an example of what? Capitalism? This, this company selling heroin and then getting in trouble from the government for selling heroin is an example of capitalism gone wrong? Bad example. Bad example. There will be alcoholics in a free country. There will be drug addicts in a free country. The problem is that when you try to get the government involved to solve that, look what you get. You get government drug dealers. The opiates. And th this is a complicated case, and lawyers are, are vultures and sharks, and they go after these companies because that's where the money is. <clears throat> but somewhere along the line, someone peddled these opiates to people knowing that they were addicted. This did happen at some point. Now, maybe it's the government's fault. I don't know why the government uh, passed on these things, and then Johnson & Johnson gets blamed. But somewhere along the line, there was a conversation where they said, well, you know, tough. we we got to sell these things to make our money back, uh, so let's do it, and let's never mind. No, what they said was, here we go. The government has okayed this. We got it approved through the FDA. So we're good to go. The responsibility was taken off the drug companies, okay, because they got it approved through the FDA. They went and got all the government checks, right, 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 and they're following the law, and now they're offering the drugs for sale through, through licensed pharmacies and through doctors with degrees and um, who have legal practices. They're selling the drugs through all the legal ways. They're paying taxes on them all. They've got them approved through the Federal Drug Administration. Everything's legal about it. So the fact that the government then at the end says, wait a minute, what's going on here? That's such a ridiculous scandal. It's so terrible. Um, the government has no business, no business telling people what to put into their bodies. They only have business telling people not to hurt other people. So the government might be able to say that you can't drink and drive, but the roads shouldn't be owned by the government, so even that would probably be up to uh, private citizens. However, it occurs to me that since that is an issue of, of violation of the rights and damaging other people, it, it occurs to me that there could be this world where the government requires road companies to give free open access to, to government vehicles, or at least to police vehicles. Police vehicles, for sure, not to government vehicles, but to police vehicles so that they could patrol and make sure the laws are being obeyed. That occurs to me as a, you know, eminent domain of the police. Police can go wherever. Something like that. Can they they can't go into your house. That's illegal search and seizure. Could they go on a road like that? I wonder. I wonder how that I th I think I would let the police go on the roads to oh, to uh maybe not speeding laws, but drinking and driving laws possibly. I don't know. That that's a conversation that we could have. The, um, the, the addiction and the trouble it's going to cause. That's, that's good objectivism. That's profit. That's making you... The addiction and the trouble it's going to cause. It'll cause less addiction and less, tr less trouble in a free country because there will be more ways and more options to get out of your addiction and to get out of your trouble and to turn your life around. So these things are less damaging in a free economy than in any other type of economy. 
I, I grant that it's damaging to have people taking heroin, and heroin is actually addictive, and here I am with my nicotine stick. So I grant that these things are going to happen, but the best option you have is capitalism, where these things do the least damage. I mean, look at the fact that I could just go down to the local store here and get a resupply of this stuff. If you make this stuff illegal, then I have to go to some thug, and taxes aren't being paid, and all right, taxes are, blah, are a different thing, uh, shouldn't be taxes, I know. But the point is, these things are these these are regulated safety-wise. If you buy them from some Yahoo on the street, you, you can't even go sue him. I mean, at least if things are, are regulated to the point where you have to be an accountable entity in order to sell something, then if you sell something that's bad, somebody can go sue you, right? You have to be able to be sued in order to enter a market, let's say. Uh, that would be, you know, a reasonable um, uh, demand that we could make in capitalism. You can't sell your services as, uh, you know, a, a, a roofer. You can't put a roof on somebody's house unless you've got a $50,000 bond in case some, some job goes bad and your roofing job needs to be replaced or something like this, and not by you, but by somebody else. And in order that you don't violate their rights, you have to be able to pay for such a disaster. So to prove that you can pay for such a disaster and not, dis not cause destruction and destroy somebody, you have to be bonded. So I think that that's a reasonable um, thing to stop wild uh, events. It's a reasonable protection of individual rights for businesses. Happy. So what? So that our cars explode when people drive them? It'll cost us less to get sued by the people whose uh, parents have died than it will to recall the cars so we won't recall the cars. I mean, that's the kind of thing that would happen in a, an Ayn Rand world. No, that's the kind of thing that happens in, in government-regulated world, where the government says, uh, you have to do safety precautions on this, that, and the other. And, you know, this stuff is insane. First of all, let me just say that. That the, the government regulations on safety in automobiles is insane. Um, they they take away things that would have made the car safer, and they put things in that make the car more dangerous. And they the the free eco the private economy comes up with something, and the government likes it, so it mandates that everybody has that thing. But that thing might not be the, like airbags. They kill some people, um, for one thing. They destroy the car. If you if you bump into another car at very low speed, sometimes it'll set these airbags off, and now you're on the hook for two or three thousand dollars worth of new airbag equipment and all this stuff. That, I mean, it ruins the car. It breaks, explosions. So you can see why the car companies like that. Yeah, let's have exploding units in all of our cars, and if any of them ever touch any each other, boom, thousands of dollars of stuff has to now be purchased. You can see why they like that regulation, but we should definitely be able to still purchase a car without these nonsense thingies, which cost a tremendous amount of money, malfunction, and even kill people. Um, so, we would have cars that blow up, huh? I'll tell you what, what's the difference between a horse and buggy and a Model T? The Model T drips oil. Did you know it has a total loss oil system on the old Model T's? You have this oil containers around the vehicle, and you fill them up, and it drips oil on various bearings and stuff. And behind the car is this line of oil drops. 100% loss oil system, Model T's. Um, and uh, they're driving around, hitting each other, blowing up. Ford Pintos used to blow up and stuff. What's the difference between that and horse and buggy days? I mean, yeah, cars will blow up, but here's what will happen. They'll get a bad reputation when they do. And the, 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 uh, the cars in Soviet Russia that blew up, the Zil or whatever, all the Soviet Russia vehicles that had whatever troubles they had, didn't matter. They kept on producing the same thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The Soviet airliners that used to fall out of the sky, just... Every once in a while, 
a flight would just not arrive, just not arrive. And of course, it's not in the newspapers or anything, but um, and there's never any announcement from the airline. And if you ask questions, you'll go to jail. But just imagine that you go to the airport to pick up your dad, and the flight never comes in, and there's never an announcement. And if you ask anybody, you'll disappear. So you go home, and you tell all your friends and family, my dad was supposed to come in on a flight, and word spreads, and you get word from somebody else, yeah, my friend was coming in on that flight, it didn't come in. So, under capitalism and freedom, these things be talked about and known, and we improve things. I mean, will we have cars that blow up? We had airplanes that fell out of the sky in the early days. We had airplanes with square windows. We had to figure out that those things are going to shatter and break apart in in flight so and we had to figure out connecting the wings properly in the structure of airplanes so yeah we're going to have cars that explode and airplanes that fall out of the sky but other societies meanwhile are going to be having uh concentration camps and genocide and famine so take your pick do you want to choose voluntarily to get into an automobile and drive around in that automobile and it may not be safe? Or would you prefer to live in a country where automobiles are illegal or else they're prohibitively expensive and taxed to high heaven and you've got to ride a horse? That's the choice we make in freedom. We have some choices. Her artistic judgments, like against Shakespeare, make no sense. because Shakespeare was not a philosopher. We don't go to him for philosophy. And why is that? Why is that? Because he was a hodgepodge. He, he just made occasional commentary. He was just a flowery speaker, brilliant speaker, uh, well-written, Shakespearean level well-written. But he's not a philosopher. He's not a thinker. And he's got a slightly malevolent universe bent to him, or maybe more than slight. Um, I wonder what his artistic view of Shakespeare is. Because, excuse me, Shakespeare, Shakespeare was not a systematic thinker. He did not have a set of ideas. You can't say, I'm a Shakespearean, can you? You can't say, oh, I, f I follow mostly the ideas of Shakespeare. Or, I get this idea from Shakespeare. You can give great quotes from Shakespeare of what some character in one of his plays said. Uh, but you can't be a Shakespearean because there's no set of ideas there. He's just a slightly malevolent universe guy. So I do wonder what Mr. Clavin says about Shakespeare. Her view of humanity is stilted uh, and wrong, and her idea of morality is stilted and wrong. Now, if Yaron Brook said that, um, that Judeo-Christian values are not Western values, that's just historically ridiculous. That is historically ridiculous. Uh, Western values, even even classical values that that predate Judeo-Christian values, come to us through the filter of Judeo-Christian values. And you cannot think that a a civilization that was called Christendom when it started is not a Christian civilization. It, it Christendom was what was there during the Dark Ages too. Right? Now, we can give a tiny iota of credit for the Dark Ages for sticking with Plato's philosophy, because that had Greek roots, and that allowed us to come back out into the Renaissance. We can give an iota of credit. But when Christianity takes over, you get the Dark Ages. Just remember that. If you want Christianity to take over again, we will go back to the Dark Ages. It's formed by it. Everything we think is formed by it. All the philosophers from Kant to Nietzsche who rejected it were dealing with the Christian inheritance. They all were. So it's ridiculous to say that those are not our values. They were dealing with the Aristotelian inheritance, the Greek inheritance. Christianity is perverted Platonism. Aristotle is what America's built on. Soviet Russia was built on Plato. Objectivism somehow are. You know, Capitalism is a system, it's a great system, it's the best economic system, but it needs to be hemmed in by morals, it needs to be hemmed in by altruism and by love. Capitalism is the moral system. It doesn't need to be hemmed in by morals, it is the moral system. It needs to be hemmed in by altruism, he says. 
Remember, ladies and gentlemen, altruism is not benevolence. Altruism isn't even a moral stance. Altruism is an epistemic stance, which is all possible paths besides reason. Reason goes one way, and altruism is in every opposite direction from reason. There's reason, which is reality, and there's every single other option, all of which end up fitting altruism. I'll prove my point very quickly. If you say altruism means caring for other people, I'll counter with Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. And I will say, how is that caring for other people? Altruism always and only leads to destruction. Altruism is irrationality. All right, so the idea that we need to hem capitalism in with a ring of irrationality is insane. The idea that we need to hem capitalism in with morality is insane. Capitalism is the system of morality. You do what you want as long as you don't hurt other people, and other people can do as they please as long as they don't hurt you. That is the system of morality. There's no other system you can even propose where one person's giving the other person orders that would be better than the people acting for themselves. Unless you don't want freedom. There you are, Andrew Clavin. Do you like freedom? You're a mixed bag. You don't know if you like freedom or not. Some form of fascist is what he comes across as, doesn't he? 